I want brand loyalty. I think long form is the way for that. In two years, you grew over 500,000 subscribers, over 130 million video views. And because of really focusing, not just on short form, but also on long form content. Like I said, storytelling, just being different. As the world gets more and more quick, snappy, we're gonna be yearning for those things that make us feel emotion again. I feel that I am in this for the long-term relationship with my audience. Welcome back to the Think Media Podcast. I'm super fired up to have Pat Flynn sharing his latest YouTube strategies. And it's pretty wild because in two years, you grew over 500,000 subscribers, uh, over 130 million video views. And as a result, this has led to now an event that has sold 1,000 tickets without any advertising to actually being known by bigger brands and people of influence, all because of starting a YouTube channel and because of really focusing not just on short form, although we're going to be covering that, but also on long form content. And Pat Flynn is really a marketing genius. He is the author of books like Superfans and Will It Fly? And he's going to be dropping some wisdom and it's going to be cool to catch up today. Pat, how's it going? Great. That was one take, dude. You're busy. I mean, we're out here. Uh, and it's been fun to hang out with you every year. This is like our annual meetup at Social Media Marketing World. And uh, just so grateful for you and your impact in uh, on our community and everything you're doing. But break down what's been happening, what's the channel, and how did you grow 500,000 subscribers in just two years? It's in 200 videos, by the way. Wow. So the power of storytelling is really what it's about. So I'm not first to create videos about Pokemon. In fact, it's just been a thing for a while. And typically people who are influencers in the world of Pokemon on YouTube are opening packs and they're making the drama exciting and they might get a big pull or, or, or they might not. And there's a lot of big names who I owe a lot of thanks to. I, I wasn't in Pokemon back in the day. I'm brand new to it. Collectibles sort of took a, a big surge during the pandemic and I, I went along with it. Um, but then after consuming all this amazing Pokemon content on YouTube, after getting involved in these communities, even being moderators for some of their channels, I was just like, I think I can bring something new here to the space. So that's what I did. And so in January of 2021, myself... Uh, my producer, Dan Patrick Norton, who I think you know, as well as uh, our editor, Zach, and, and Jay on the Discord, we just kind of put our heads together and started creating content that we thought people would want to watch. And it all really comes down to just, like I said, storytelling and and just being different, right? And, you know, the fact that I didn't know anything about Pokemon, I knew I had to take a, a special role in this space because I couldn't compete on other people's collections. They've been collecting for longer than I, so I can't compete with those people. I don't know a lot about the, the topic and there's people who are experts in this space. So I had to come in from a learn with me approach, right? And I think, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about that a lot, like working in public, just kind of journaling and, and bringing people along for the ride. And if you can combine that with good storytelling, people can actually relate better to you because, I mean, they can teach you a thing and, and they're mm -hmm. in it with you. There's so many unlocks here. I think one thing that's fascinating is, as Gary calls it, document, don't create. For anybody that feels like they're not an expert, which you are not, it is possible to get in the game with the learn with me approach. I think what's also fascinating is you're like the ultimate hybrid because I feel like Think Media Podcast, you know, our community really doesn't lean as much towards the entertainment side of things. You know, not our creators are not aspiring to be like a Mr. Beast. A lot of business owners, entrepreneurs looking for leads, clients, and sales, or people that are getting in with a hobby and they're monetizing that, moms and DIY channels. But what's fascinating about you is you've got this whole smart passive income business, podcasts and brand and YouTube channel, and you've been known for affiliate marketing, but you've also been a great entrepreneur because you've built some automation, a lot of automation into that team and systems which allowed you to, with all your marketing knowledge and how to send out and how to have a niche and with the ability to then take something that was new to your life that tied into your passion and your family, you literally launch a whole new project because you're kind of a weird guy in the sense, you know, in the sense where you were the smart passive income guy, but now literally you have a Pokemon conference with a thousand tickets sold already with no advertising on the back end of this YouTube channel, a new brand, basically. You're best-selling author and speaker, but yet you got, you're about Pokemon. So I, I'm, the bridge I want to connect for our community is, is that there's not even maybe just the business that you're doing right now, but there's also that as you learn the skills of YouTube, of marketing, of what are you also passionate about is what's maybe a future business you want to launch, a future project, a second channel. You should have do all things at once. Maybe break down the journey of your brands and your projects. Because I think some people might think, oh, I need to write a book, start a podcast, start a brand, make online courses. You've done all the above, but you didn't do it all in one year. Yeah. 
it's an iterative approach. And the way I like to think about it, I actually had to break this down to teach other people stuff because the more stuff I was able to do over time, yeah. the more people started to see all those things and try to do all of them at the same time. Mm. I got to remember, I got to tell people, and even with this channel, right, it's just started two years ago and it's so big now. They're like, oh, it's an overnight success. I'm like, no, I started on YouTube in 09. This channel just happened to be created in like year 12, right? So it's been a long time to come. But I'm a very, I'm very much a person who wants to do all the things. But if I did all the things, I would accomplish nothing. Yeah. And so I have a rule called the 20% itch rule. And this isn't anything new. That's just the name I put on it uh, to be able to share this. But it's eventually, it's basically 80% of my time is dedicated to the things that I've already committed to, things I said yes to already. 20% of my time is dedicated to experimentation, fun, trying things. They may not work and that's okay. And typically it's not a zero sum anything because I'm always learning and, and reapplying to the other things too. So this is my way to p place boundaries around the curiosity that I have to try something new. From 2017 to 2019, if you've been watching Think Media for a while, you might've heard of something called the Switch Pod. That was my 20% of time between 2017 and 2019. That's mostly automated now. And Caleb, my partner, is doing a really, really good job upkeeping that. Um, and we're still making sales and that's going. But I needed something new because I want to scratch that itch. But again, doing it in a very purposeful manner. And uh, again, even if it failed, that, that's okay. This one, the Pokemon one, happens to be the most successful 20% of my time that I've done. But this isn't new. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this. Ramit said he dedicates Fridays to Creative Day in his business. Uh, Google allows for their employees one day of the week to just build new random things that aren't, you know, what they were assigned to do. So I've adopted that into my creativity and it's a way for me to control all the things I want to do. Yeah. Um, and right now I'm having a ton of fun. And what's cool about that is that if you're doing your 20% on something like your Pokemon channel, you still have these other things where you're learning all these insights. You're learning click-through rates and marketing and storytelling that then applies. You're writing a new book. And so you're probably constantly getting better at psychology and thinking about marketing and positioning. And so having that creative margin, 20% rule, is going to enhance everything else you do. For sure. I mean, there is this philosophy of just do one thing, right? There's a book about that. I, I preached that for a while, but then I, I, I just can't do one thing, mm -hmm. right? I like to say uh, I'm a pad of all trades, master of fun. But also, <laughs> that's funny, uh, but you also have developed the skill of delegation, true? Yes. And automation. Sure important and profitability so that you could reinvest dollars into you switch pod is a physical product you launched that you put a lot of time into you got it to lift off but then you also now have it the way it's able to run is because of caleb and because of systems because of the heavy lifting up front right a 3pl or a third party logistics which we ship all those switch pods to you that then just take care of all of those things like we remove as much of the work that's required from us as humans on the team as possible um, and then part of that is also making decisions on what we should and shouldn't do, right? We could get into Best Buys. In fact, we tried that and we found that the process was just so convoluted and taking so much energy that it wasn't even worth the potential end reward there. So we're just sticking with our Shopify account and our Amazon account to sell the Switch Pod. Um, so being very disciplined is a very important thing. And sometimes you don't know what to say yes to or to say no to until later. And again, being 15 years into this journey now, it's it's... It's clear for me, but it's a language I've learned over time. And it's one you can learn from people that you follow online faster. But the best way to learn is to just try and fail. Yeah. So I want to talk about long form video in a bit, but I want to stay on this and, and talk a little bit about maybe even some principles from your book, Will It Fly? Because you launched this new project and someone's listening to this, they're getting excited because maybe they felt constrained and they feel niched down. Maybe they don't have enough team systems, automation, profitability to add more on because that'd cause more stress. But assuming they do, or they've got some level of that, or they're just going to take their 20% time, what is your, what is a few principles for thinking about starting a second project from the standpoint of you're very intelligent. You didn't know if this Pokemon thing would work, but there's probably some principles where it at least had a shot to. It at least maybe pot, pot, passed some of the will it fly criteria. And what is that framework? Yeah, I, get, I, I, I want to give things the best chance to succeed. Yeah. If you're just creating and guessing, you, you, you're you leaving it up to change. And there are some things you can do to stack things in your favor so that you have a little bit more percentage opportunity. And so with this channel, we didn't just dive right in and start filming, right? Which is very common to do. And oftentimes it's like, just like Seth Godin says, like, just ship it. 
-hmm. Well, you still need to know what direction you want that ship to go, mm -hmm. right? So we did a lot of research and, and I did a lot of research being involved in these communities first, being a moderator to different channels. And really once I finally got into those spaces, having direct, mostly direct message on Instagram, uh, conversations with other fans of those channels, just to ask them what they liked about them, what they didn't like, what do you wish existed? What do you think um, there should be more of? Uh, this is part of the Will It Fly process is, is just analysis of who's in the space that you want mm -hmm. to um, you know, reach out to. And you know, that's really important because you might find through that research that it's actually not something you want to do anymore because of what you've learned from that research. I found that that, that gave me more energy to then create. And then from there, uh, it was it was a lot of um, taking what I what I've learned on my other channel, which was a lot of mistakes, not being hyper focused and not focusing on titles and thumbnails as much as I should have, wanting to make sure that I do it right this time. So there was a lot of research into well, what thumbnails in the Pokemon space seem to be working really well, which ones aren't working really well. Um, not getting into super analysis with like spreadsheets and stuff, but just noticing patterns and then deploying those and seeing what happened. Uh, but mostly conversations. And you'll find that the first half of Will It Fly is all about diving into those communities and discovering who those people are and, and what are their, why are they here? I mean, I, I, I discovered through that process that most of the audiences that watched Pokemon channels were men between 25 and 35. These were people who in 1999 and, and 2000, when Pokemon came out, these were the kids who were going to spend their allowance on Pokemon. These guys are now older now with money mm -hmm. and they're diving back into it and reliving that nostalgia so now I can understand that when I'm creating a video for somebody. Wow, that's that's super fascinating. And so, of course, we'll link that up in the show notes. Will It Fly is the book if you're thinking about launching a new project, and really a business, like will it be a profitable business? Will It Fly and uh, some powerful insights there. You're going to do a keynote all about long-form video, yeah. which is fascinating because the trend right now, YouTube shorts, Reels is blowing up everywhere. Everyone's obsessed with vertical video. But of course, long form hasn't really gone anywhere, but it's kind of being forgotten about and it's less talked about. And you're literally the closing keynote of this conference. Break it down. What What is your opinion? First of all, maybe at a high level, short form versus long form. Both are awesome, by the way. Don't think I hate short form, but I love the ability to go deep. And you can only go so deep in a minute long snack. And that's that's the analogy I like to use with short form is like a snack. It's like a Reese's Pieces or Reese's Buttercup. Amazing. I want more. But then if I have too much, I feel stuffed and sick. And that's sometimes we feel that when we overabsorb too much shorts or mm. uh, reels or TikToks, right? And it's like the equivalent of you as a creator for snacks or short form is like you're you're you have the house that the Halloween kids are coming up to. They get the snack from you and then they move on. It's like, I want to be the chef who has the restaurant that people come to and can sit down and have an experience. Mm -hmm. Not only do they have an experience, they go home and tell everybody about that experience and then they invite them to come too, right? I feel that I am in this for the long-term relationship with my audience. I want brand loyalty. I think long form is the way for that, um, right? Long form is where brand loyalty comes from. Now, both work over time. I, I actually start out my keynote talking about two creators. One's a short form creator. One's a long one. Uh, the first one, his name's Aaron. Most people don't know him, but they know his pet seagull, mm -hmm. Stephen. And he's a person who feeds the seagull every day. And he's like training it to, you know, come into the house. And like, it's, it's his pets, pet Stephen, Stephen Seagull. See? Uh, but then there's another creator who's very similar. His name's Brady. He has a channel. But people don't know Brady. They know Leon the lobster, the lobster that he rescued from a grocery store and raised it as a pet. And this series went super viral, and that's on long form. And you'll find that for each of those channels, whenever they talk about Steven or Leon, that there's a, just a plethora of views. But you can feel a little bit more of a relationship with Leon and the lobster, and there's merch, and there's other things that go along mm. with that. And again, from from a loyalty standpoint, I mean, if you've seen friends, like he's her lost, right? Like it's that's a stupid joke, but I'm gonna keep it in the keynote you know, anyway because I have a gift to support that, and it's too late to change it. But uh, you know, for 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 Leon Lobster and for long form, that's where loyalty is. And yeah. like you said, I think I think as the world gets more and more just quick, snappy, snacky, um, we're gonna be yearning for those things that make us feel emotion again and mm. that's not to say you can't do that in a short i mean i've watched some shorts that have made me cry because they're really good at storytelling but over the long term especially with brand loyalty and building super fans i think long form's the way to go and if you understand how youtube works with title thumbnail algorithm and, and just essentially replacing algorithm with audience uh there's some amazing opportunities there do you upload shorts on deep pocket monster 
we have in the past. Now, this was before YouTube bridged shorts with longs, and 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 we got penalized for that essentially because our shorts were taking over the spots that our longs would have been suggested. So we saw a ton of views with shorts, but we didn't see people coming back after those views. Number one and number two, it started to reach parts of the world that weren't my audience. People who were commenting on these Pokemon shorts, like these guys are stupid. Why are they paying money for mm. kids' cardboard? So it's like getting reach, but it's also kind of toxic because it's not tapping into the heart of the community. It's just tapping into viewers that are... Right. But we did get subs from those, and some of those subs have went on to become fans. But our long-form videos have a way of just riding on the YouTube algorithm to find exactly who the perfect viewer is, mm-hmm. right? For exactly the kind of content that we create to a point where I'm getting recognized on the street now. People are coming to an event that has never been done before uh, to literally sending me messages that the content has saved their life to families saying, we spend every Monday night with you live. And they just sit down, eat dinner, watch Deep Pocket Monster, and it's a part of their routine. And somebody reached out to me the, the other day and it was like, Pat, it's so cool that um, in 30 years when I have conversations with my son, we're going to talk about the nostalgia of watching Deep Pocket Monster. Jeez. It's just like... That's wild, dude. Nobody said that about a top five tips for Facebook on my other YouTube channel. Right. Right. Because those don't tell stories. That's information. Yeah. Now I'm trying to learn from Deep Pocket Monster to teach and tell story infotainment on the Pat Flynn channel. And that seems to be working a little bit better. Yeah. Right. Not just listicles and such, but actually bringing some story into it. So I could take a top five Facebook tips approach, but I can turn that into something that now is more of an experiment where you don't know what the end is going to be like and there is something at stake perhaps. So I'm I'm actually learning a lot from the Pokemon channel that I'm bringing into my other stuff too. Storytelling is a big buzzword I've heard from people here. I've said, hey, what do you want to learn at Social Media Marketing World? And people have said, I want to get better at storytelling. I want to learn storytelling. And now you're talking about long form, but you're saying the magic there is long form with a story. Is there any initial framework that you can give us of what are the elements of story and even on our next YouTube video where it might feel a little bit overwhelming if we're not going to go to the level of editing or even time? What are some maybe mini improvements where we could bring story into a more business context where we're going live for 35 minutes doing a presentation and be better at storytelling? Yeah, great question. So there's a few frameworks that I like to work off of. I mean, if you are telling the story about a person and what they've done, the hero's journey framework is really amazing. Here's where they were. Here's what their struggles were. Here's the adventure they went on to discover something new and the challenges that happened. Here's the guide, hopefully you, coming into place. And then now here they are after all that, slaying the dragon. Look at how much better their life is now. That framework is an archetype that exists in most stories that we all fall in love with. And that's one that we could adopt for our businesses for sure if we wanted to, especially if we're telling the story about a student of ours or a client or something. I would highly recommend reading a book called um, Building Story Brand with Donald Miller. It basically teaches you how to do that, right? Your student is the hero of the story and you become the guy that then everybody else wants to go through that same journey with. Yes. Right. So the hero's archetype is really great. I think even more simple, especially if you're just teaching something, is just trying to ask yourself, like, why is this important? And what can, like, what's an outcome that we don't know the result yet until we do this thing? I was helping a person the other day who does Facebook ads on YouTube, and he was like, well, I want to create a really compelling story out of teaching um, this new feature about YouTube. Like, how do I, how do I do that? It seems fake. Mm. And I'm like, can you just put maybe a hundred bucks up and say, hey, I'm going to spend a hundred bucks on this new tool. And it's either going to work better or worse than what I used to do. And already he's like, now I have to watch this video. Like that makes total sense. Yeah. Right? It's a hook. There's a hook. There's something. What's, yeah. Now. How did he lose the hundred? What happened with it? Right. And you pull him right into the beginning rather than even just being, I'm about to teach you about this new feature. Right. Right. I did a video on my Pat Flynn channel. Um, that, that's a huge point though. I'm not starting videos anymore ever explaining what I'm about to talk about. I'm just going to get right into it. Yeah. So I did a video for podcasters on my Pat Flynn channel uh, using chat GPT. So before I would have looked at the camera and said, hey, guys, in this video, I'm going to teach you three things that you can do with chat GPT to increase your speed with your podcast or something like that. Right. Yeah. And then boom, let's go. The first shot is me in chat GPT typing what questions should I ask Tim Ferriss for my podcast? And and now you already are like, well, what are those questions? And then I just keep taking further. What are some personal questions I could ask Tim Ferriss? And then 
after a minute and a half of really intriguing stuff. Hey guys, chat GPT, that's what we're talking about today. That was tip number one. Here's tip number two. And mm. it's just the retention graph is flat from the start as a result of that, which is which is like if, if you ever go into analytics, you'll often find that a certain per, like a large percentage of people drop off right at the beginning. Yes. And then it flat. It's flat if you're if you're good. Why not take the beginning out and just get to that part where it's already flat? And it's we're using a lot of data and stuff to uh, analyze what to do and what not to do. And that was a, that was a big one for us on the Pokemon channel. And I'm now incorporating that into more of an information channel. Is there any specific books or TED Talks or podcasts or movies that have helped you become a better storyteller that you'd also recommend? All TED Talks, number one. All of them. All of them. I and mean, the whole Talk Like TED, which is a book about the structure of a TED Talk. Right. Like I mean, simply studying the structure of a TED Talk itself, 17 minutes. Watch any TED Talk and ask yourself, how are they starting this 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 talk? They never say, hey guys, in this talk. No, they're like, I was five years old. And they're pointing to something on the, and it's yeah. like, you're, you don't have time to, to wonder whether this is worth your time. Cause you're already just sort of the hook to the end. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's some amazing, like, ones. yeah, like the year that my grandfather passed away was the darkest though, like some statement. And then you're like, oh, it pulls your heart immediately. Night, oh, it was 1986 or, you know, and the stock market just crashed. I'm staring at my computer, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And, and you don't want to, you don't necessarily even have to script it per se and and you like just be yourself and tell the story like mm -hmm. you would tell anybody else right and then you can add on all the tricks that we know about youtube to you know add b-roll and engaging text and you know zooms like all that kind of stuff you you pick up those things over time but you could have a like if you watch any of those leon the lobster videos yeah it's like terrible quality and it's just like a long run-on shot of some like his first video was like oh you could edit that way better it didn't matter because the title was um, like, can I raise a grocery store lobster to be a pet? Mm -hmm. 18 million views in like a year. Yeah. Because that's a question. Like you, you either thought about that before and never yeah. figured out or you're like, I wonder. Compelling topic. Right. Yeah. And now it's two years later, Leon's still alive. Yeah. And he's healthy looking. Like in the beginning, he did some good things though. His thumbnail in the beginning, the Leon the lobster, you saw that giant rubber band on the claw. Mm -hmm. Like that's yeah. very like visual oh, that is a grocery store lobster, right? And then um, you see, like, when they when he snaps it off, you see, like, discoloration around his claw. But then over time, you're like, uh, and, and the guy Brady mentions it, he's like, oh, look at his claw. Like, it looks healthy again. He's actually moving it. And you're just like... I'm, like, getting choked up. It's a grocery store like, lobster. I am, I would, I eat lobster, and uh, I love lobster, but now I'm, like... I'm I'm questioning my decisions. <laughs> I'm thinking about the emotions of the it lobster. Probably has had that impact on people. I, I'm like I'm like that lobster is a person. Um, that poor claw. Don't, don't name your food that you're about to eat. Yeah, man, Larry the lobster. Le, uh, Leon the Leon Leon. Man, bro, my heart is pitter patter. What else? TED talks. Um, <laughs> storytelling. Storytelling. I mean, there are some people who who um. I mean, you've taught storytelling on your channel before. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of other great YouTubers. But I, I feel like as opposed to even just looking for those stories and, and, and like, what do you consume on YouTube mm -hmm. and why do you consume it? What about whatever it is you're watching in any genre? And what's the structure? Right. What movies that you go, I don't know what it is, but I don't care about the characters or why is it flat or it hasn't grabbed me or what about this pulled right. me in? What oh, yeah. The cadence? Great. Like, like randomly, the, like we're in a space that looks like a airport. I'm thinking of The Terminal with Tom Hanks. And why, why do people love that movie? It's about a guy who ended up living in an airport terminal because his country was in war and he was he was kind of an in-betweener at that point. But like the best moments of that are like when he's putting, you know, ketchup on a cracker because that was the only food he could afford. And, and, and it's like, oh my gosh, like he's like trying to figure it out in some creative way. And how can I in my videos... Uh, using Facebook make the equivalent of a cracker with, you know, ketchup. Oh, I have to use like these 20 tools to do this thing that's not available yet because they're too expensive. But people appreciate that because you're trying to survive and figure it out. I don't know. I'm just making this up. But, yeah. you know, you could pull inspiration like that. And when you, at, when you watch stuff and ask yourself, why did I transport myself into that moment right now? You can, you can learn and pick up a lot of things too. There's a, a, a YouTuber who I remember creating a video and it went viral and I started to ask questions like, can I adopt that similar structure into one of my videos? This this video was uh, ex was a guy, Lewis created a machine to slap a chicken fast enough to see if it could cook. Okay. So it was like, can you cook a chicken by slapping it? 
Okay. Which you're like, wait, what? Like, I got to open that up. And it's this m- machine that he built. Yeah. But he didn't just start building the machine. He said, why is this even a question we're wondering? Well, there are 20 years of Reddits talking about the mathematics behind this and why it actually would be possible. But they're here. There's like, nobody's built the machine to figure it out. So I'm going to do that. Yeah. So he built this thing and there's like a time lapse and there's trial error, things failing. And he actually does it. Were a lot of chickens murdered? In the- um, I mean, these were grocery store chickens. Oh, so they were already, they're already frozen. And, and, yeah. As opposed to like live chickens. Oh, I slap a live chicken. It would, that would be a murder. There's a lot of, yeah, and there's a lot of tension in this podcast episode because we've had empathy for a lobster, but now we're over here just slaughtering we're chickens. People to vegetarian right now. Yeah, uh, this is this is intense. <laughs> it's never happened before on the podcast. And Pokemon is like animals. Oh my gosh, this it's just like full circle now. Does anyone ever die in Pokemon? No. Yeah, so. But they get, they, they like, they faint. Okay. And they go back in their Pokeball. So they, they could be revived later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. There was a huge debate about this when Pokemon came out. They were like, they're like, parents were not okay with it. Anyway, going back to which animal were we on? Oh, chicken. 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 Slapping the grocery store chickens and cooking them because right. they're slapped so fast. And it was such an intriguing video that I was like, are there any questions in the Pokemon space that I could build something for to find out the answer to? And there was. There's there's these cards that you can get graded and they, the cards still shake inside of there and there's been debate for years whether or not that actually is damaging to the cards. So I was like, I'm just going to follow act by act, not frame by frame, but kind of. Yeah. Exactly what Lewis did. But I'm going to build a machine out of Lego to shake a Pokemon card and I'm going to have the same arc of the story and I did it and it went gangbusters. Wow. And even people who don't care about graded cards just love the way that was framed and put together and like the time lapse of me building a Lego with a motor to shake a thing. Um, and then I pulled from Mythbusters at the end of that episode too, because you know Mythbusters, they, they bust it, but then they're like, let's just take it to the extreme. So I got like a jackhammer and I put a card on it to shake like 100,000 times per minute and it totally demolished the card inside, Yeah, uh, which was just a, a fun kind of gush at the end of the video. So so the unlock here is you're also, if you're kind of diversifying your consumption and maybe learning from just good storytelling in general, divergent ideas in YouTube in general and kind of storytelling frameworks, then you could pull those frameworks and think about how could I apply that to my niche of real estate, sure. my niche of being a loan officer as a fitness coach, as someone that's doing cooking videos, as someone who's vlogging and trying to figure out bringing, of course, storytelling is the essence of really making your vlog take off. And so you're pulling storytelling principles from multiple sources and then pulling them into what you're doing. Ryan, Tra- you'll, you'll notice a lot of Ryan Trahan type things that I do in Deep Pocket Monster. A lot of the self-deprecation, putting myself into nervous situations, which is genuine. Yeah. But we purposefully put ourselves in those situations because we see that that makes everything more human with relation to Ryan's stuff. Uh, And there's some just like the one where he went to go uh, find a fossil so that he could... Like the whole story was he, he brought a dinosaur bone to show and tell when he was six. But he lied and said it was it was real when it was obviously plastic. And he said he like felt so bad about that for years, which he probably wasn't even thinking about it day by day. But it was a good story. I'm going to go get a real fossil. I've found a fossil expert and I'm going to take it back to my teacher. And so I can like redeem myself as this evil person and, and when I was six. And just the way that unfolds and he brings an expert in who's like the guide in the hero's story. But then the teacher he talks about and, and he rewards her with some money at the end as a as a gift. And it wasn't even about the money. That was like a nice surprise at the end. I mean, he's just a genius with that stuff. I, I would consume every Ryan Trahan interview um, in addition to like any Mr. Beast interview because getting into their brains for free is pretty amazing. That's powerful. So I've got a final question for you in a second, but I want to actually encourage listeners there's some powerful episodes, uh, our last year's conversation. We'll link these all up in the show notes. A while back, we talked about email marketing. You were dropping bombs on that. And do you think email marketing is relevant in 2023? More than ever. Yeah. Why do you say that? Because we're so disconnected from all the social platforms that we all follow each other on that it's really hard to have a personal conversation with somebody. And email is still the most powerful way to just get into a person's hmm. mind and 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 help them or 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 encourage them to go in a different direction. You know, direct messages are great, but you can only do or, and reach so many people in the day or, or at the same time. Uh, with the broadcast emails, I, th- I feel like I feel like there's a huge opportunity for so many creators who just miss out. And I think those who do capitalize on email and building a list are going to be way ahead of the game because, as we all know, you know, TikTok could go away tomorrow. Facebook just laid off 10,000 people or Meta. 
today and and like who knows yeah our accounts that we're building up on other people's sandboxes might be closed yeah and so email if for anything insurance yeah right to stay connected to your audience is important let alone the fact that you could have an event come out and just email everybody and say hey tickets are now available and then you know people buy them um there's uh, you got to watch that video. yeah i love it i love it so if you are, if that piques your interest, check out the show notes because we've got a uh, past episode talking all about email marketing. Go deeper with that. Pat dropped some very strategic episodes on the Thick Media Podcast about more YouTube strategy. But as we land the plane, I'm just going to play a quick round of uh, overrated, underrated with you here and curious about your take as a smart entrepreneur and uh, YouTube creator, um, some of the YouTube features. So YouTube community tab, overrated or underrated? Underrated. We, I use it all the time. Yeah. And Multiple times a day. Uh, once or twice per week. I know there's some people who use it daily. Yeah. There are some things that people say about utilizing that tab, thus then allowing for your other videos to be seen more. I'm not sure how much that's true. I think it was true at one point with polls yeah. specifically. I don't know if that still works, but it's about community. Let's yeah. communicate with the people who are there and share some of the fun insider things that are happening. Also, put a timestamp on what's going on in, in your business and, and, and with your audience. Uh, it's a great way that we let people know what's coming. YouTube stories. Is it rated at all? I don't know if anybody uses it. I mean, Dan and I on my team, we test it. We do get some views and we do get some people coming in, but um, I think it's definitely underutilized, but it's not talked about very much. I mean, I'm curious your take on it. Yeah, I think that YouTube stories, if you have to have 10,000 subscribers, assuming you do, they last seven days and you might as well do it once a week, in my opinion. Yeah. I Because we pull 30,000, 50,000 views on ours on Think Media, but one of the videos can have a sticker. So if anything, you could do a 15 second clip to just remind somebody about something in your past library with one clickable video and that's going to last seven days. That's nice. So, it, so it's a might as well. So it, it is a might as well. It's not like, oh, that's the tactic that changed everything. But if you have, if you're disciplined, you throw some reminders on your calendar on Tuesday mornings, which would be every seven days at 845 in the morning, my Google calendar tells me to post a YouTube story. And you post it yourself? And I post it myself. And I say like, hey, it, either something new or something passed in the library, because if you're getting new subscribers, the yes, YouTube recommendations and maybe people will dig, but there's a lot of people who won't know. It also does grow subscribers, like 16, I mean, at our size, like 26. So that's weird. Mm. Um, and it does give you the data. And then we always do a second story to say, and by the way, if you didn't know we have a podcast channel, you could do then a sticker to another channel. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just not a fan of these, sure, you might as well, because any time you say yes to a, sure, and no offense, but any time you say yes to a sure, I might as well, that's time you're taking away from maybe putting more effort into a better story video and yeah. better story. So, you know, I'm very disciplined with my time. Yeah. So it's like, I might as well, but that doesn't mean I should. Sure. Yeah. And I think the ROI of that makes sense. There is one other piece at scale. If you have somebody helping you on the social side, Brian on our team has also downloaded like my Instagram stories, which is kind of where I vlog. So I, I basically vlog daily. Yeah. It'd be called Rise and Grind. And so every day, Rise and Grind. And coffee, it's- Coffee related in that? Yeah. Like Rise and Grind Coffee. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, it's a little bit of Rise and Hustle, but you know, family, we have the same thing. It's it's, it's definitely about- I, so, I, I'm imagining the logo and the branding already. So. Yeah. So like Rise and Grind, I've been saying it for probably like five years now. And so whatever, I will say certain things on there that he then just throws over on stories. And then that becomes a leverage. But see, that's not you doing it. That's Brian doing it, which is- But it is me. It's me- that day on a different platform on video and he downloaded. But that additional, the additional work to get it to the other correct is somebody else, which is great. Like if you can clone yourself or have somebody do those things for you. Systems, for team it. and whatever. That was quite a bit on, on YouTube stories, which are just not rated. We've decided those are not rated. Overrated, underrated. Uh, creators launching products, Mr. Beast Feastables, Logan Paul, KSI, uh, Prime. Underrated. I think, you know, you're mentioning all the big names, right? Yeah. And Prime's worth, I don't know how many billion now, and Beastables is crazy. We had our first at Walmart the other day. It's actually pretty good. Yeah. I got to say, it's not bad. Um, only six ingredients. So, okay, that's, that's cool. But I think for like the creator who's watching this or listening to this right now, there's always huge opportunities to create something that can serve your audience, right? And it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't ha even have to be an invention like the Switch Pod, which was that was one of our answers to a problem that myself, Caleb, and our audience had at the time for videographers. There might be a coaching program. There might be a service that you could offer. 
And you don't have to go big real fast. In fact, in Will It Fly, it's about getting your first customer and that's it. Because when you unlock one, you unlock more. And the ability to find one is much more, it's, it's, there's a lot of less weight involved with finding one person to help getting them a result. But when you get that result and you unlock that transformation for them, it unlocks a transformation in you because you go, wow, I can actually do this. I can actually help somebody. There's no question anymore. It's fact. And then you almost feel responsible to go and uh, find other people. It's almost your obligation at that point. Overrated, underrated, going live on YouTube underrated it's one of my favorite things to do we went live when we hit 500,000 subscribers and we had concurrently 5,000 people watching a grown 40 year old man open pokemon cards with cartoons on them and uh it was the it was just such good energy not just for me but the people to be there in support of this thing that they enjoy and and to to be around the other nerds that are like them right that's what i talk about in super fans is you like somebody needs to step up to create a place for people to find people like them. And when you do that, it only enhances your brand it, 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 because really it's not even about you it, and, and, and what you're creating as far as like content. It's about the community and the audience that can come and find other people like them because really all people want is to, to feel like they belong to something and, and that they're not alone. Deeper on the live thing, you went live for over a thousand days in a row. On a, a year in a row, 365. 365 days in a row in a year on the Pat Flynn channel with business content. Yeah, during the pandemic. And that you know, did not grow my channel. Just okay. Up. It it was that overrated or underrated? That was overrated for that's going to grow your channel and you're going to get so many views. Underrated for just how deep the connections were made with the people who continued to come and watch every single day. I have some people who still reach out to me and say that the income stream like saved them during the pandemic. It was mm -hmm. the only thing regular that they could look forward to during that time. And it's just again, there, there there's there's not hundreds of thousands of people saying that but you know a couple hundred that matters did it change you yeah how so it changed me in understanding that uh, i didn't have to get just views to be successful i got loyalty during that time it also honed in on my skills of going live and creating content on the fly really really well it allowed me to get better at storytelling just because i had a platform every day to tell story on it was purposefully stories as well because stories I can just tell on the fly versus if it's a scripted information piece, that's, that's I don't have time if I'm going every day to script every word. So tell a story here about that. Okay, and then trust myself just to tell it. And then over time, you begin to learn strategies of what works and what doesn't. I got really efficient. I think you remember this. There was a, a virtual event that you created during the pandemic after I've gone live for, you know, 200 days or so. And you and your whole team was like, you have multiple camera angles like in your home with yeah. like flyovers and zoom ins. Like, yeah. how are you doing this from your own office with you were, you were the best virtual speaker at our event, Grow a Video Live Virtual, and as a solo creator with angle switches, the, how you built your office, and it was a progression. Sound effects. Yeah, stream deck. Yep, and uh, that's amazing. A few years back, as the creator of Smart Passive Income, a huge audio podcast, cor courses on podcasting, you've helped a lot of people on podcasting, you told me... You should absolutely not do video podcasting because it'll divert your focus and the audio experience, you're in someone's ear, there's that whole intimacy. Well, fast forward to today, and now there's youtube.com forward slash podcast with yep. an S. Things have changed. Joe Rogan, podcast, Logan Paul, H3H3, Valuetainment. Colin Samir. Uh, Colin Samir. Uh, video podcasting, overrated or underrated? And do you still believe you shouldn't get on camera when doing a podcast? I think you should turn the camera on when you're recording a podcast, even if it's audio only, so that you have that visual in case you want to use it. Now, if you really want a successful video podcast, you're going to have to up the production more than just turning on Squadcast and seeing the two faces. Mm. That said, also having the camera on allows you to take then really nice clips that don't have to be super produced, but they're about a very specific topic. So I'm in the middle of video podcasting because I was always against it. I was like, video, like, it, that's not what a regular creator should do right now, even though Joe Rogan was huge and, and still is and it's taking off, although he's on Spotify now. Sure. Uh, but I think for, it's getting easier and easier now to do it. I think the technology there makes it easy so that it's it's not as hard um, it still is a separate media format than the audio format. And I think that if you're going to do both, you got to be aware that 
you're either going to create a really amazing audio experience that, and then the video is going to be secondhand and have to catch up to it or vice versa. And that's mainly what's happening now is it's primarily built for the video and watching experience, but then, you know, a video that would make a good video is not going to necessarily have the best audio for audio. So if I could snap my fingers and not have to like, you know, work to create the content, I would have a video podcast for video and then I'd have an audio podcast for audio. Got it. Um, overrated, underrated TikTok. Overrated. Overrated, underrated Instagram. Overrated. Overrated, underrated Facebook. <laughs> Way overrated. Overrated, underrated YouTube. Underrated. YouTube's underrated. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Oh yeah. What do you think the future of YouTube is? I I, I don't know how to answer that question. All I know is it's going to be continually trying to get better at feeding the right videos to the right people. And if you are a creator who has a message to share and you get good at sharing that message, YouTube will do the work to find those people for you. Pat Flynn, uh, what do you want to shout out and promote Think Media Podcast? Of course, lots of resources. The past episodes is a library of gold that's good to grab a journal, especially the email marketing episode because it's so tactical and you share a lot of actionable things there. Many of Pat bo- Pat's books, I'm kind of telling you, them your things but super fans is one of my favorite books in fact i actually think what we're going to do is release it was just i was going through my mind we sunsetted our inner circle program but it was amazing you taught super fans and i think maybe we'll just drop that maybe somewhere exclusively to our vra community or maybe on the podcast but you have other conversations out there where you taught super fans besides all of those resources and check out the show notes pat flynn where can people check you out thank you sean thank you everybody so our biggest thing right now in spi this might be interesting for you and we could we could jam on this later is, you know, we've had dozens of courses created over time, and many of them have helped thousands of people. Uh, We were beginning to notice that the completion rates of those courses were dwindling, and especially during the pandemic. And this makes sense. People weren't getting the ability to have the motivation to just go through those courses on their own. So what we've since created is something called the All Access Pass, where we now sell access to all of our courses. But access to all the courses wouldn't be valuable. That's actually more overwhelming. What you get is you actually get a guide and pathways through the courses that are right for you. So you can actually make your own path through the courses. So if you're a podcaster, for example, you take our Power Up podcasting course, you graduate from there, go to our second level course. Maybe you want to now start building an email list, go to the email marketing course. Maybe you now want to do video uh, uh, podcasting. Cool. Take that workshop and you can go through those lanes in the way that works best for you. But what is really a hit right now is these things called accelerators. So we have a teacher come in to teach an entire group of people going through one of those courses at the same time. Cohorts. Cohorts. Yeah. But it's asynchronous. You don't have to show up to a call to learn the lessons. You take the lesson on your own during that week, but you just go through those first two because that's what everybody's assigned. Now there's accountability and the completion rates are off the charts and the feedback has been like amazing. So I'm just proud of my team for figuring out a solution to take all this knowledge and package it in a way that teaches still has some cohort based uh, status, but is also asynchronous enough for everybody's busy schedules. So I'm very proud of that because that's that's the big thing we've been working on on SPI the past couple of years. That sounds amazing. So definitely take some time to get to the show notes of this episode to uh, access some of these resources. Pat Flynn, check them out all on social media. And Deep Pocket Monster, let's get our Pokemon on. And uh, man, I appreciate you. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thank you.